My name is Angel Jane, and I would like to welcome you to See Beyond, a podcast in which we meet people who tell us how they see beyond their visual impairment. Before we get started today, I would just like to remind you that you can tune in to See Beyond on multiple platforms, which are all linked in the description below. Today, I am here with Randy Owen, an inspiring individual who's going to help us see beyond. Hi, Randy. How have you been doing? Hi, Angel. It's, it, it's uh, honestly a little nervous about this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been setting up for the last hour, and and uh, and I do this also, so I, I know there's a lot of behind the scenes work. So I'm a little little nervous, but but we'll get past that. How are you yeah. doing? Yeah. Oh well, I'm very excited to have you today. We've kind of talked a little in advance, like had a couple calls, but I haven't been able to like meet you personally yet. So this is great. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, to live in a time where we we can talk in real time on the internet like this, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it definitely is. And actually, before we start today, I just wanted to let everyone listening um, to know that Randy actually also has a podcast. You can see the name of his podcast in his background. <laughs> and I am actually going to be in one of his episodes. So that is very exciting. Wait, and wait. I'm also going to be linking Randy's podcast in the description below. So definitely go check it out. And in fact, would you like to just quickly tell us what your podcast is about for our viewers? Absolutely. So the podcast, thank you very much. Um, on In the background, there's actually a, a, a large TV that has the Beyond Barriers Unscripted logo, and it's called the Beyond Barriers Unscripted Podcast. And it's focused around folks uh, that inspire me that are living beyond barriers. You know, we talk about what they do. Most of the folks are actually in the blind and low vision community. Uh, myself as a member, I just, uh, I've been fortunate enough to witnesses and be a part of it so i just thought it'd be kind of cool to create a podcast yeah that's amazing um and i'm very excited to record our episode so me too <laughs> all right well do you want to get started with our questions sure absolutely fire away so my first question for you um is could you tell us a little bit about your visual impairment sure sure so um and i'm not sure if it's rod cone dystrophy or cone rod i've talked with ophthalmologists since you know over the years and every time i say it's rod cone they're like are you sure it's not cone rod but basically i was born with a condition that where i don't have all the rods and cones on the retina so if you think of your retina as a piece of film right mm -hmm. and back in the day we had you know when we use cameras with film we had where it doesn't have as many photo cells or you know what i mean photoreceptors on your film if your retina if you call your retina your film and your camera so it's, I'm missing, I have areas on my retina where I'm missing rods and cones. And, and the, the importance of those are is cones, I believe, detect color. And I believe that the rods are more of a light sensitive. Right. So with that condition, I have issues with, yes, I'm partially sighted. Uh, I don't see detail. Colors are very smeary to me, I, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, I have enough vision to get myself into trouble. <laughs> I wore contact lenses when I was younger, and then during my 20s, I developed a condition called keratoconus, which basically your oh. corneas distort. So if you've ever seen a contact lens, they kind of fit like a symmetrical, nice suction cup, and it just holds holds onto your eye, just kind of it sticks on there. Yeah. And I noticed in my late 20s that my lenses kept falling out, and um, you know, okay, I need a new prescription. It turns out I have this this other condition called keratoconus. I had. Um, and then I also have myopia, which is just extreme nearsightedness. So with the keratoconus, I had an eye, or not an eye transplant, but I had a cornea transplant in 2014. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the end result was it was a lot of um, recovery to go through. I had a lot of stitches to get removed. And because of the severe myopia and just the way my eyesight is, it, I really didn't benefit from it. Um, to explain it, if I hold my eye like, or my fingertip like about an inch off of my eye, and it's getting as I get older, I can't even see the fingerprint anymore. But oh, it, um, wow. it used to be where that's where my focal point was. I could focus right there. And then, of course, after you have one corner you're replaced and the other eyes left the way it was and, and you're in your 40s, um, the extreme difference between your focal length is kind of disorienting. So um, yeah. I've learned, you know, I wore glasses when I was younger. 
over the years, I've just learned little techniques that a lot of low vision people just kind of adopt. I don't think we even think about it. Um, and I've just, you know, with my connection with where I work and, and what I do, I've learned a lot of technology and I've learned, you know, somebody said to me a few years ago, I was doing an assessment at, at, I was going to be a student somewhere. And she said to me, she says, you know, Randy, why don't you save the vision that you have for looking at the pictures of your loved ones? You can get that iPad and get it real close, but let the computer do the work for you. You know, and, and that stuck with me. Um, I've lived a life where I've had to strain to just do normal things to read and, and you get back pain and all that stuff as a result. But when you learn how to use the technology, if it's available to you, um, it, it's a game changer. It, it really is. I'm able to sit right now and I'm, I'm talking with you and I, I, and I have a 27 inch uh, iMac and it's sitting probably about 18 inches away from my face, but I have the screen really zoomed in. So I, as I look at the screen, I'm looking right at you. Right. Right. You're still really, really blurry. Um, but to orient myself, it, 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 it is nice, but uh, I've really learned to embrace the cane in the last five years. I had to give up cycling. Um, and I, you know, this, the cane's a lifesaver when you're out in public because uh, I'm not tripping over stuff. I've walked up to people <laughs> mistakenly and started talking to them before without the cane and, and they don't know. They're like, what's this guy's issue? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I hope that gives you an idea. Oh, no, definitely. That's, that was very informative. And I totally, like, I think that's such a great, like, idea that you were talking about is how, like, you, like, unknowingly started to adopt these, like, little techniques that started to help you over the years. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely important not to give up early on because you'll definitely adopt these techniques as you progress in your journey. Yeah, I mean, you kind of, when you grow up with this, and, I, and I'm speaking from from the perspective of somebody who's always had vision issues, mm -hmm. okay? There are people who go through life with 20-20 vision and then they're middle age and they're in the middle of a career and they lose their eyesight. I didn't go through that, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is what was normal to me all the time. And you just learn, you know, that a child is very resilient and you just learn to adapt and you learn, you learn things like, well, don't run off in front of the crowd because you might, you might hit something and get hurt. Mm -hmm. So you kind of observe what your surrounding, you know, the people in your surroundings are doing. I don't have a guide dog, but I've learned that when I'm out walk, I have two little carriers. And when I'm out walking them, I can feel by the tension on their leash, you know, if there's something to be aware of or if there's something, you know what I mean? Not always what it is, but it's, it's a good little warning. Small dogs are awesome. <laughs> right. And um, you were also mentioning how you had to like give up cycling, right? Um, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, that's kind of like my little segue of what are your passions and did you have to give up any other than cycling? Yeah, you know, and I think honestly, I think it's, it's a combination of vision loss. You know, my vision's not gotten better. Um, age and wisdom. <laughs> I, I've had spills on bicycles and they hurt. And when you get older, you don't heal as, as quickly. Um, I've never been able to drive legally or safely. And so cycling was always something that I loved doing. And where I live, we have the American River Bike Trail. And it goes all the way from basically downtown Sacramento all the way up. It's 22 miles, I think. It may be more. Oh, wow. but it goes all the way up into Folsom up by the, the fish hatchery up there. And it's, there's this annual thing where you get to see the, I think it's, um, they hatch all these fish and it comes out of the fish hatchery. And there's people that go up there. But I always rode that as a teenager growing up. And it was one place where I could safely get out there and just go for it, you know, and go fast because I couldn't drive a car. And I had experiences in the past where when I ran, I was a good runner when I was younger, but I've also hit poles <laughs> and some other stuff. And, and <laughs> it's okay to laugh because it's funny now. Um, but, you know, so that's, I, I really held on. That was a passion of mine, being able to cycle, doing kayaking and, you know, as I've gotten older, the last time I rode was probably about five, six years ago, and I was on the bike trail coming back, and I just had like $200 worth of work done to this bike. It was a vintage Cannondale, and I'm cruising. I'm only doing 10 miles an hour, you know, mm -hmm. and the the whole bike trail <laughs> turned on me, and I oh. didn't catch it, and then all of a sudden, you feel the gravel, and you, you can hear them. It's like, uh-oh. I better stop, you know, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I didn't even realize that it had happened until it was too late. And I, and I realized just like, you know what, it's, it's, you're going to hurt somebody or you're going to get hurt yourself. You've got right. these grown up kids. You got a couple of really nice bikes. Why don't you, you know, give them to your family members and let them enjoy them. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I remember that you were telling me that you like skiing and paddleboarding and camping. So um, like what kind of distinguished not like giving up on those activities from the activities you told me about earlier? Quite frankly, you know, with the water sports thing, let's just, let's talk about that and we'll come into the skiing in a minute because the skiing is more of a recent thing. It's, it's one of those bucket list items I've always wanted to do. Um, but back to the water sports, I've always, you know, with the low vision and traffic, you can't drive cars, uh, be careful with your bike. And so I had these buddies back in the nineties and we would go out on their jet skis and they would let me ride the jet ski. You know, people wouldn't go skiing with me or, you know, not downhill skiing or anything like that. But the, uh, my buddy, Chris, he, him and Tommy would take me out on these jet skis and we'd go out on the river and it was the closest thing I could think to actually riding like bicycle motocross or actual motocross where you're just boom, 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 you know, and yeah, it, was yeah. just, it was just a blast. And if I stayed out in the main way, I was safe, you know. Um, right. And there's not that many things out on the water. Or there's like, not. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's not. If, 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 if you're, you know, and it's part of the reason why I go where I go today when I paddleboard, because I go in a safe place. I'm familiar with it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But um you know, I was just like any other kid growing up. And when we turned 16, the other, you know, all my friends were getting driver's licenses and I couldn't. And so I always wanted speed, you know, I wanted to go fast, just like everybody else. And so jet skiing was a way and we, we rolled the old jet skis that you have to stand on, you know, you mm -hmm. kneel on them first. And then you, if we, if you get good, you can stand up on them. Uh, these are before the Polaris. And um, so I really liked, I figured that water was a safe place for me to to get out and do stuff. And I had friends that would let me do it. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I was up uh, camping with family and my daughters, I have adult children and my daughters had uh, some friends that brought some kayaks up. I love kayaking. I've done it, you know, all my life. Uh, and they had that and they had these inflatable paddle boards and I'm like inflatable. I'm like, that's yeah, whatever, you know? And they're like, no dad, you don't understand this thing's $700 and it's made out of Kevlar. Oh my God. And so I get out on this board and it's, it's like this huge surfboard, but it's really, really light, you know, and mm -hmm. you go out on the river and there's enough room for me to have my dog on there, my grandson on there. It's wide enough. It's not like a kayak where kayaks and canoes tend to really roll easily. Right. Yeah. Paddle boards are more flat, so you can stand up on them and just, and if you go to the right place, like I go up to, uh, with our family, we go up to a place called, it's um, the Union Valley Reservoir. It's up up the highway 50. Like mm -hmm. you're going towards, uh, like if you're in Sacramento, you're going up towards South Lake Tahoe. It's about 40 miles this side of Tahoe. And there's a campground in there. We go up to Ice House Road, and then we go up to uh, this campground called Jones Fork. And it's the Ice House Reservoir or something like that. But it's this huge lake. There's an island apparently on the north side of it. I've never made it, you know, around there. But what I do is when we go up there, we go into the campsite. We usually go up like on a Wednesday because it's, it's popular during the weekend. So we want to get right. a good spot. And there's a spot that we have in there. And it's like on this hill. So you go down into the parking loop, right? And where the campgrounds are. And down by the, the lake, there's like this little elevated campsite. And you go there and you set up. Well, on the far side of that, somebody has dug. Uh, it's like a staircase. So it's really easy. So I don't take a cane out there. I'll, I'll grab a stick or have my, again, I'll have my dog with me. And you can, you know, you just grab a stick so you can feel, because I don't, my depth perception is not good. So you can, you know, feel where the next step is. And so you don't trip over stuff. And you just walk down the staircase and there's literally like this little mini beach there. And so we'll blow up all our inflatables. We'll put our kayaks down there and we'll be out there for five days a week. You know, little tricks I've learned is like put a radio right by the, where that, that landing is, you mm -hmm. know. Oh, so you yeah. can like remember. I can it hear is. it. Yeah, because I get too far from shore. I don't, it all looks the same to me. Right. <laughs> Again, I'm really familiar with it. And I, I remember listening to a podcast that you did recently and you had a, another guest talking about camping and the little yeah. techniques that he used. And I, I could just relate to that so much. Right. You know? Yeah, that's what I love about interviewing people. It's like learning these new techniques and realizing like how universal they are and like how helpful they can be. I, I think, you know, in all honesty, I think sighted people do the same thing in some degree. You know, I was at the bus stop coming home. It was about two years ago. And this young lady walked up to me and she could tell that I had some vision, but I had a white cane. And she's like, you know, she wanted to know. She asked a legitimate question, you know, can you see? And we started talking and she was really candid, but she was respectful about it. And I, you know, and I, and I basically, I said, look, when you put your shoes on in the morning, do you look at them? 
You don't need to, do you? You just reach down and you can fill and tie them and, and snug them up and fit them the way you want to, right? Yay. So I, I think a lot of these techniques, I think a lot of people use them. Yeah. We're just maybe not paying as much attention. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, there's definitely low vision and no vision techniques, absolutely, and technology that we use. Um, you know, I, I've had a, I have a large family and it's very, very supportive. I have a, my wife and I <laughs> raised uh, nine children. We have a nine and wow. children between the ages of 21 and 32. And now we have six grandsons and, uh, you know, it's like a different chapter in your life. So what was really important when you were younger, the priorities change, you know, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things I, I, I want to talk about skiing, um, a couple, is that okay? Right. Yeah. I, I actually don't want to dominate the conversation. Oh no, no. I love hearing about this, but I had a quick question actually. Sure. Was it hard? Like being like, a being like a dad type of figure um, with like nine children and then like also having to face your own obstacles? That's a fantastic question what you just asked. You were asking about the challenges of raising nine children. Right. And then you were asking, is there anything additional with low vision and vision issues, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. Ops, absolutely. Um, let me, there, there's one thing I wanna point out is that people that have vision issues, they're people, so they have all the challenges that everybody else has. And I'm not saying that we have mm -hmm. more challenges than, you know what I mean? It, yeah, just, yeah. Um, so with the nine children, we had a blended family. So that was tough <laughs> when you've got stepkids. That in itself is tough. Mm -hmm. um, I do, and I spoke about this in one of the podcasts I did. I was talking with another dad who raised a son. And, you know, you get into those preteen years and the kids are out playing baseball. You know, and I, and I tried to play baseball when I was a kid and I, and I couldn't do it. Um, I did it anyways, but wasn't any good. And so there's things that, you, you know, you feel like maybe you transfer to your kid because you, you're not out there playing catch with all the other dads. Right. But I think, you know, you find other, other ways to connect. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I didn't drive my kids, but I'll tell you this. Because when I was younger and I, you know, thank goodness, thank God, thank the universe, I never hurt anybody or, or myself, I did try to drive and I learned how to drive a stick and I can, you know, I, um, a manual transmission. So I remember when the kids were coming of age, you know, they're, they're 15 years old and they want their, their, their permits, what we would do, and my wife couldn't really, she just, for whatever reason, she wanted me to teach them how to drive a stick. Yeah. So what would happen is we would go over to a big parking lot. Uh, there was a park in the neighborhood and we would go in the big parking lot and we would sit there and it's like, okay, I'm going to show you how to do this. And I would sit in the driver's seat and I would explain. So the hardest thing with, with, with driving a manual is that first gear, right? So it's really just a balancing act. You got to rev the engine, feel it, listen to it. And as you do it, let off that clutch and you'll start to move forward. And once I taught the kids how to master first gear and reverse and just to listen and pay attention they were able to, you know, they all got their licenses on time. Um, yeah. So that was, that was kind of an, an exciting uh, thing that we got to do that. I think that most people, wait a minute, you're legally blind and you're teaching your kids how to drive. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was that. Um, I'm a, the type of person that learned very early on that, yeah, you are different a little bit than other people. Yeah, your your disability isn't necessarily visible to people, and they're not going to understand why you wear really thick glasses and still can't see the board. So I learned at a very early age to kind of just address that, whether it was through humor, whether it was making some smart comment about my eyesight or making a joke. You know, I I, I always I just have that kind of personality where, um, you know, I'll I'll break the ice. I'll, I'll right. You'll something. just let them know, like before they come asking with questions type of yep. thing. Yep. I've made the mistake, you know, when I, uh, when I was young and I, I, and I went into a job and I didn't say anything on the belt division and it was, they had one position open. I remember, and there was another guy and basically both of us got in cause we had friends that worked there and we went through and I didn't put down that I had any visual impairment and it, you know, it became obvious during the shift. And, uh, of course they let me go because of that, because I, I wasn't, you know, and they only, I mean, I understand they had one spot open, but I learned, I think with that experience is, you know, if you really want something, don't hide, just, just be mm -hmm. forthcoming. And, and if they can't accept it, then maybe you need to, to, to go down another road, 
you know, I, I've been in relationships and I was, I was with, I, I had a girlfriend one time, um, but she had never seen me with my glasses and I wore really, and I can't wear them now because they don't help, but she had never seen me with these glasses and we went somewhere is where I really wanted to see what was going on. And I broke these glasses out and I put them on and she's, Oh no, 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 no. You know, put those away. Um, oh, I'll guide she you said through. That? And it was devastating. It was, it was devastating inside because it's like, wow, you know, you, you know, this person can't accept you like that. But what I learned, it was an opportunity to kind of grow because I had a decision to make. Is it really important to me that she accepts me or that, because she's not going to accept me. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Or do I learn how to accept myself? I don't need her approval. Does right. That sense? And I, yeah, I know no, that's, that's kind of a little touchy feely, but it's, no, it's and important actually, to me. yeah, no, I, I definitely, cause this is interesting because from one of my other episodes, I kind of learned, um, a little lesson that like a lot of times when you don't inform someone that you have like a visual impairment mm -hmm. they'll translate like if you like make a mistake or something they'll translate that to like your intelligence and oh yeah and when you deal with when you throw culture into that oh yeah it, yeah, yeah they yeah. they translate it to your intelligence and then they think that like i don't know you're not as smart as everyone else which is totally not true so i think it's it is best to just be upfront yeah it, it is it doesn't you know, I'm not, a. I took a, and I'm not, I don't mean to sound extreme, but I, when I was taking a college class, I took an ethics class and, and the professor said, look, if you're going to tell lies or mistruths, or if you're going to mislead somebody, you need to keep a journal on it. Mm -hmm. You need to keep your story straight down the road. So it's oh, a lot that's easier. So true. It's just a lot easier to just be direct and be upfront, you know, yeah, and, and, if, and if they can't handle it, then maybe it wasn't meant to be. Right. And um, I, I totally understand and agree with like, you should be upfront, but there are a lot of people who aren't comfortable being um, upfront. And so sure. what advice would you give to those type of people? Well, you know, it comes from within. Mm -hmm. It comes from within. I can't make you accept me. And I've learned that, that the word acceptance doesn't mean that you like it, that you agree with it, but it means, okay, look, this is the deal. I'm not going to be a truck driver. You know what? When I wanted to be, when I was a kid, I wanted to be one of those, those pilots that flew off the aircraft carrier. That's not going to happen. What other passions, what other interests, what else am I good at? You know, and I think it's really important, whether you're sighted or not, that you do something that you enjoy, that you do something that you're good at, that you do something that's hard, but that you're able to see the progress and that you're able to move. I, I think if you didn't have that, it'd be pretty boring. Yeah. And no, I totally agree with what you were saying. Like you wanted to become like a pilot, but you have to accept yeah. that. Like you can't yeah. do that. And I think, happen. yeah. And I think that's actually the same for sighted people too, because I remember when I was little, I wanted to pursue basketball, but yeah. I was just, I was very skinny <laughs> and I like, it just wasn't meant for me. And I had yeah. to like realize that basketball just wasn't meant for me and I had to kind of move on. So I think it's kind of like a universal thing too. Exactly. And I think, you know, just to refer back to my podcast, you had asked me a couple of weeks ago, what was the point? What was the goal? Yeah. And I, and I said something about inspire and it's just, it's, I'm really into just, I just want to be a part of, I don't want to necessarily always be different or my, the thing that's different about me. I don't want it to be an inconvenience for somebody else. I really don't want it to even be an issue. Mm -hmm. I just, let's, let's just do this. You know what I mean? And I, and I think a lot of people feel that way. I honestly, I feel like everyone personally, they think that they're different. And so everyone yeah. is yeah. different. So it's nothing yep. to be insecure about. And right. I think that's like something to keep in mind, which is what you said earlier. So, and you, you said that you said the word right there, you know, to lead, you know, acceptance, because when you don't have acceptance, you're a little bit insecure about yourself. And right. I think that you need to make that appropriate. You know, creative people are insecure. I, I, I do believe. But if I'm insecure about my, my eye condition, what's that about? You know what I mean? What, what can I do? It's, it's really an inside job. It's not something that somebody else can give me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being honest, I think uh, falling down and failing, I think those are excellent learning opportunities. It's really mm -hmm. about how do you pick yourself back up and, and move right. forward. 
And I saw this thing the other day. It was like, fail is actually your first attempt in learning. Yeah. And I was like, wow, like I never thought of it that way. Failure was just such a negative word in my life. And I think in a lot of people's life, it's such a negative word, but you don't realize that you learn so much out of it, which I think is really important. I teach assistive technology and I always tell my students, and I'm a firm believer in this, and I stole this from somebody else. You have to make the necessary mistakes to master the skill. Mm-hmm. You don't get it. That's how you get experience. Right. You, you can read about it. Your buddy can tell you about it. But until you know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. my opinion. Yeah, well, we really took a deep turn there, but I really enjoyed sorry. talking about that. No, don't be sorry. I like talking about that. Um, but I think we were about to talk about your passion for skiing. So if you'd like to go <laughs> yeah, ahead with that. I'll come in. So um, I grew up, you know, I was born in 1970. And my whole life, you know, when I, li- when I lived in East Germany as a kid or West Germany as a kid, we did cross country skiing with Cub Scouts and all that stuff. But nobody would ever go downhill skiing with me. And it's like, to me, honestly, I'm lazy. Cross country skiing, it's too much work. You want to go to the top of the hill and you want to come down. You know, that's what I've always wanted to do. And it's an expensive hobby. It's an expensive sport to get into. But then, you know, for me, what that barrier always was, or what I couldn't see beyond, or my friends couldn't see beyond, <laughs> was really <laughs> a little play on I like there. what you did there. Yeah. Um, but, we, but, but it really brings meaning to the title of the podcast. And, and That's exactly well. why I, I, I love that. that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, of course, I got, um, I know, you know, nobody ever wanted to take me. And um, so I, I start working at Society for the Blind in 2016. There was a, an O&M instructor, orientation and mobility instructor. We had there named Greg DeWall. And he had, like, all these connections with all, and he was really into outdoor sports. So he had all these connections in the area where we live. We're in the valley, but we have the Sierra Mountains towards Tahoe and Reno, and it's just great ski territory. And you want to go to the snow, and it's close enough. So I've always wanted to do that. And so Greg connected with this uh, local ophthalmologist named Dr. Christian Serdal. I'll give uh, Dr. Chris a plug. Uh, but him and his wife are local ophthalmologists, and they're also really, really into skiing. They're associated with these ski clubs up at UC Davis. And so I, I think it was about four years ago, we had an opportunity where he sponsored his ski team or he or his office sponsored uh, four of us to go up to a place called a Chief Tahoe. Now, a Chief Tahoe is located up by Truckee, and it's in the Alpine Meadows kind of area. Mm-hmm. And they have a, the lodge is called a, a Chief Tahoe. And they are, from my understanding, and you can go online and look them up, they're a Chief Tahoe. Uh, but my understanding is they were started doing outdoor sports and they were like war veterans or, or, or um, patients that had amputations. And so they had modified gear to go water skiing, downhill skiing and all this stuff. So they, they do this thing year round where it's outdoor sports, snowmobiling. Uh, I think they recently started a sailing thing for blind and there's another mm-hmm. one in San Francisco. So it's, it's just awesome. So I go up there the first time I've never been downhill skiing and I get, and I get, paired up with this one-on-one instructor and this guy is the real deal and he has experience working with blind uh skiers so there's several ways they go about this a lot of times they'll start off with a like a pole it's about an eight foot pole and you stand side by side and of course you work you start at the bottom of the hill Mm -hmm. you know the bottom of the hill is really about getting control controlling your speed being able to stop and being aware of what's going on and if you've ever been skiing it's really easy to get disoriented especially when you have vision because there's a time when you, there, where you don't feel emotion, you know what I mean? And I'll talk about that in a minute, how I deal with that. But, you know, that first, that first. Oh, like you don't realize you're moving? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll explain, <laughs> I'm going to describe that to you in yeah, a minute. Yeah, yeah. And my workaround for that. So the first time, you know, I, I've been up three times, three years. We were supposed to go this year, but it got canceled because of COVID. But um, when I finally got up on the skis, you know, the first lesson was really tough. And I had to get some adjustments made to my boots and blah, blah, blah. But when I finally got going up the ski lift and started skiing, I noticed that because of my eyesight, I don't really see a lot of detail. It's a very high contrast. So you have everything is white and then you have dark trees. Mm-hmm. Well, with my eye condition, the white will glare out like things like poles, <laughs> small mm-hmm. children. So I ski with a guide and the guide, you know, the first time he told me, he's like, well, I'm going to ski behind you and I'm going to call out left, right, you know, hold straight, whatever. And it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you, you need to be right, right with me or right in front of me. You know, if you get more than 
because of my depth perception. If he gets too far in front of me, I can't tell how far he is. I can't see the detail. It's just everything whites out. So you learn the course. You don't go skiing in between the trees. And you have a good guide. And you have that, that trust in that relationship. I think any outdoor sports that you do, because we do kayaking also. Um, and I have coworkers that go on these cross-country trips every year. Um, you had a guest, actually, who does one of the cross-country, uh, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you just learn. It's really important, I think, with a guide that you have that trust. I right. need to trust this person so I don't fall off the, tie, the side of this mountain. So I don't slam into that, that lift pole that's out there in the middle of the ski run. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think those things I'm not really worried about. What my biggest deal is children. A lot of times you'll see there'll be like five-year-olds out there that are skiing. And because um, it's really easy to get going fast, and I'm going to segue into that, I noticed one time that I came up on this kid kind of a little bit faster than I expected to. I didn't realize I was going that fast. So what mm -hmm. I learned was with the poles, if you just kind of periodically just take a stab at the ground, you'll notice if, if I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but it'll pull away. It'll like really pull quick. back. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, and I remember the first time I did that and it's like, whoa, dude, you're going way faster than you thought you were, you know? Mm -hmm. And then if you get, you know, there's things like if um, I noticed this last time we were up there and it was real icy conditions and that's cool. It's interesting because you can kind of get going sideways, but the snow came in and we had this, this like fresh powder that came in and all mm -hmm. of a sudden everything got dead quiet. There was no echo. And it was just this whole different texture that you're skiing in and you don't have a lot of the audio cues that you had before. It, it, it was just, I think it was, it got so quiet that it was almost shocking at first. Like, whoa, am I in a studio or what happened? And yeah. I realized it was because there was this loose powder at, around everywhere, everywhere you could go. And it just right. really kills that echo. Yeah, it absorbs the sound. Yeah, it does. It, it, it does. You don't realize how much I think that you depend on that. And even as a person with vision, um, because I've become, you know, my vision's declined and I've become more comfortable with, with the techniques that I've learned. Um, you don't, it's always been there. You just mm -hmm. don't, you just don't notice it or don't pay attention to it. And what I mean is sighted people, same thing. They'll notice the same thing unless they have hearing loss, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's very interesting that like, I really like the pull trick that you told me because I wouldn't have, uh, like I was trying to think of a workaround when you told me the issue you were facing, but I couldn't think of something. I would prefer to ski without those poles, mm -hmm. but I take them with, Are they heavy? so I can gauge my speed. No, they're really light, but you kind of have to hold them. And you, when you have them and you've got them up in the air, you're kind of using them as also as a balancing point. So mm -hmm. you have to be kind of, I mean, you get used to it. And again, I only do this once a year. I'd love to do it more. Um, and I'm sure I would get more used to it. But it's just, it's just one of those techniques that you learn. Um, don't go skiing in the trees. Uh, make sure, you know, always, you know, one of the big things that we teach at society, um, especially with the O&M training and living skills, it's, it's really, there's, there's nothing that can substitute good preparation. So if you go on that ski slope and you're blind, it's a good idea to go through and make sure that you can stop safely. Make sure that you can gauge your speed. Make sure that you're familiar with the terrain because you'll notice that when you're coming down the run, when you're in the middle of the, of the ski run, it's fairly flat. But when I go over to the left side, I'm going to feel kind of an embankment. There's going to be a little bit of a pitch change. Same thing with the right. If it's a good, if it's, if it's a well-groomed ski run that you're on, you know, um, there's all these things that you can, you can pick up and still enjoy it. It's, it's, it's an amazing sensation. I don't know if you've ever done downhill skiing, but I remember feeling, I, like haven't. I, was, I remember feeling like I was flying because oh. I couldn't feel the vibration. It was so smooth. Right. And it's like, I, like I'm a bird just kind of like flying low and soaring right. down the side of this mountain. And it was just, it was awesome. You know? Wow. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. Wow. Well, all of this advice has been great to listen to. And I hope that um, the people listening will hopefully try skiing one day and use this advice. Um, yeah. And, you know, and I've been with people that it's, it's not their thing. Right. Um, and I mean, I'm excited and I, I've never been skiing before just because I'm afraid of heights. But um, yeah. It's not the height that gets you the impact. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was a bad joke. You know, now that you say heights, um, I was like all hot dog and I was proud of myself. And then the third time we went up, so this, this place at Alpine Meadows or a cheap Tahoe, 
they have, you go up to, it probably goes up maybe a quarter mile. So the first ski lift you get on, you go up, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go up the next section of the ski lift. And there's all these runs that go off to these other mountains. And then they had this third lift, right? And I had never been to the third lift until this last time I went. And I, heights never bothered me, but I got to tell you, um, when we got up there, I was scared. And it wasn't so much the height, but the, the inclination, the right. incline of the hill was like crazy. I know. I, it feels like you could fall almost. Like. It looked, yeah. And it's like, and I don't know where to fall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, and you get up there and you're not, I'm not worried about hitting a tree. I'm worried about falling off the side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but, it, you know, it's one of those things that if, you don't experience in life, you know, I think part of living is having the heartbreak, is having the success, is having the joy, it's having, it's being able to cry, it's being able to laugh, and mm -hmm. just be you, you know, and, and learn how to accept and embrace who you are, right? right. I mean, that's just my philosophy. So I kind of wanted to segue um, into a different topic. Now, I know that you have a podcast and a music group, so I would love it if you could tell us some more about that. Cool, cool. Um, you know, again, and this goes back to, I think, just just wanting to be a part of um, my whole life. When I was a kid, I played trumpet in band for about two years. I was okay, um, but I got to a point where I had to, I could either do that or I can go take as my elective. I could take computers, and I got into computers. So I stepped away from music for a long time, um, and then, but I've always had this interest in wanting to record. When In my early 20s, I worked in a couple local radio stations, and I did production work. I learned how to cut tape and, you know, how to EQ stuff and, and, and all that technical stuff. Um, so I've always had an interest in that. And, but I had, you know, a family, like I mentioned earlier, that I had to, that was top priority. Mm -hmm. So I started working at Society for the Blind in 2016. I was actually hired on April Fool's Day. <laughs> that's interesting and and very early on i had a student named joe germino and it, it's interesting because he's uh, the most recent uh guest on my podcast and he was a musician and he told me the story about you know he told me his story and how he got into music and i remember one day he said to me you know i can play the song judith on the guitar and it's like whoa okay you got my attention and so i brought a guitar in and i had this macbook and way to hook it up in this program called logic and you know, we started learning how to record that way and people started showing up and we were doing this originally in my office during lunch. And then uh, the executive director kind of got wind of what we were doing and said, Hey, we have this space down in the building. Uh, it's about 3000 square feet and it was called cold storage at the time. And it wasn't developed. It was not, it was bare walls, bare concrete floor. Mm -hmm. The overhead was the trusses and all, all that stuff that we had to pull extension cords out in there. But they gave us this little section to go out there, you know, a couple times a week, and we would just do it on a regular basis, and we would play music. And that's how I got into it. And I got into wow. Playing, yeah, I got into playing drums. I don't know if you can see. I've got a few instruments <laughs> behind me. Um, so that's kind of how that started, and it was just really inspiring. What I noticed in my students was when they played music, they became very confident. And so I always, you know, I, I say the two C's is confidence and community, right? Mm -hmm. And so we got this group of people that would come down and they would listen, or if they never played before, they would play. And so the music group started off that way. During that, we started recording all of our sessions, right? And so what I would do is I would take the recording, I would just hit record, we go in there and play, and then I'd go, go home and I would cut all the chit chat out. And I have a YouTube channel called Beyond Barriers Project. Mm -hmm. And so I started uploading videos and the idea was that the members that were playing, they could go for free and they could really, you know, just one click on, the, on just a link and they could go hear themselves play. And you know what? We have over 24,000. We have, we're about 24,000 views right now. 20, wow. 20, 23, five to 4,000. <laughs> we have 48 subscribers. And when I look at the data on it, uh, there's a lot of people that, that watch this that, that are not subscribers. So give it in a plug, please subscribe to Beyond Barriers Project. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the music channel, YouTube channel. The other thing that came out because of COVID, we got to a place where we couldn't meet weekly. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've always had this interest in recording. Uh, I just recently started taking a class again because of COVID. They're offering this class online. It's recording studio techniques over at a local JC. So I'm actually doing that now as well and learning how to improve my production, um, hopefully. But 
so the podcast started, you know, about a year and a half ago, I kind of, we were at a staff meeting. It's like, you know what? I think I would like to get a student where I could train them and, and teach them how to do this. You know, I started getting students that were, that were blind, that wanted to do content creation and, and were really interested in YouTube and podcasting. And um, a couple months ago, I want to say April or March, I have a, a tech student named Omar and uh, he's a musician. And we just were kind of goofing around one morning. It's like, well, let's see if we could actually do this with a Zoom meeting. You know, I got an idea for it. And um, we got a good response to it. You know, I put it up on the YouTube channel. He put it up on his. We got a good little response. And that's where it started with the podcast. It's finally, I had this idea. Now I've got the time to do it because I'm not spending three hours a day traveling. You know, right. I'm working from home. I actually work from where I'm sitting right now. Mm -hmm. I work full time from here during the week and I teach technology. So, um, you know, right now it's, it's just, you, you know, I see the time that we live in as a chance to really reinvent yourself. Um, my dad, you know, my dad always, anytime I'd say, Oh, well, there's a challenge. My dad would always say, you can look at that as an opportunity as well. Right. Have a choice. So where's the opportunity here? Well, I wanted to do this podcast for a while. And I remember it was about a month and a half ago. I reached out to you. I was scared. <laughs> I was scared. I was scared. I saw your, I, I, you know, I saw your trailer and it really inspired me. It's like, dude, you really need to step up your game with this, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I think I sent you an email and I was scared that you weren't going to reply or it just, you know, it, like I said, I think creative people have that insecurity. I think a lot of us do. Um, and we're going to flip roles here in a little while. <laughs> <Anyways>. <laughs> right. So, um, but I, I think, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's another chapter in my life. My kids are raised. I don't have the insecurities that I had earlier. Now I have a new group of insecurities and new, new group of goals. And, um, I've been offered just a really great opportunity with, with the ability to work from home. A lot of people lost their jobs, you know, and because, and, and also, and I'm going to say this as, as a cited assistive tech instructor, a lot of people have their opinions about that. And what I mean is when you're completely blind and, and I have these prejudices myself, when I took O&M, I would prefer to have it from somebody who's completely blind, somebody who lives that way. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's just, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with that, that belief. And I think, but as, as a side of that though, I think a lot of sighted uh, instructors kind of get a bad rap. Um, not all of us are the same. I do use a screen reader. I do. I, I followed Peg's advice. I, I, when I want to look at a picture, I use my eyesight, but when I need to read something, I'm using a screen reader. Right. And I walk the walk, I, you know, and I, and I talk the talk. Um, and it took me a long time to become comfortable with that. You know, I, uh, I, I can I close with one more story? Cause I know we're getting close on time. Yeah, of course. Pain story. Okay. And it's okay to laugh at this one. Okay. We tell us at the graduations. So in 2015, I had come back. I was, I was, um, basically, I actually, it was, um, yeah. So I come back for some refresher courses. I want to get some certification in it, and I took some O and M training, orientation and mobility cane training. So the way it works is you wear, if you're sighted, you wear these, uh, that we call them learning shades, but they're sleep shades mm -hmm. and you go and you walk around the neighborhood and, and whatever. And there's this park that I was really familiar with down by where I work. And I've been through there as a sighted person, you know, I've been going to that park for years. And so I'm out there with Diane one day <laughs> and she, and I've got my cane and she, and we're talking about how you can feel the texture, you know, a straight cane. I, I, I'm a firm believer in using a straight cane. A lot of reasons why, but go ahead, Randy, go ahead and explore. See if you can find the sidewalk, see if you can find the grass, see if you can find, you know, the, the drinking fountains, whatever. And I'm, and I'm exploring and I tap and I, and I hear something metal. Mm -hmm. And I knew, you know, because I'm familiar with this park, I already knew what it was. It's a park bench or it's a drinking fountain. So mm -hmm. I reach out with my hand immediately and I grab this, and a, a handful of beard. There was a guy sleeping on the bench. <gasps> oh my God. And I grabbed his beard. That would have been so scary. <laughs> well, the funny thing, well, scary for who? For me or for him? Because I'm thinking from his perspective, he's got a lady who's obviously blind. She's got a cane and she's got this other guy with a white cane and he's wearing sleep shades and he's, and I, and I wasn't bothering anybody and you're grabbing my beard. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, you know, and the thing is I kept my composure. I didn't pull the shades off. I, you know, I apologized for it. I said, so, so sorry, sir. And um, I kind of regrouped myself with trying not to laugh because I was really embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And then, you know, Diane, who's happens to be one of my coworkers now, um, you know, we laugh about that every now and then. So we're in 2006 and one of the things they wanted me to take was cane travel. And I always assisted taking cane travel, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to need that. And so, um, I had, uh, they hired, meaning department of rehab, they hired an O&M instructor. Now this guy is certified. He's NOMC. He's the real deal. Right. But he's sighted and he right. drives and he drives. And I just remember the feelings of, I was kind of judgmental because he was sighted. It's like, uh, and then years later in 2015, I kind of went and took a refresher course. And it was that, that instructor Diana was just telling you about, she's mm -hmm. completely blind and she's cool if I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's been doing it her whole life. And when she said, Randy, we're going to go to do an O&M lesson today. I didn't hesitate. I didn't, I didn't, excuse me. I didn't question it. Mm -hmm. Not for one second. And I just say this because I think there is a natural prejudice that we have. And, I, and when I took the ethics class that I mentioned earlier, it's really important that I recognize what my prejudices are and, and investigate that because I can change it if I want to. You know what I mean? And I can change yeah. my way of thinking. And, and when I do, maybe I'm a little bit more open because that first instructor was an excellent, excellent O&M instructor. He took me into this like shop that was all glass and crystal and I didn't break anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, yeah. it, was, it was totally fine. He took me through places where there's heavy traffic and, and nobody got, you know what I mean? So he was totally, but because I had that prejudice, that preconception going in, um, I think, you know, that can keep you from, it can kind of reduce your experience a little bit, maybe. Yeah, that's very, that's an interesting topic to think about, um, about our prejudices, so. Yeah, I think we all have them, you know. And, you know, the only other thing I would say is there, is to people that are out there, we live in, we live in a worldwide community now, and there's a lot of cultures out there. Mm -hmm. And I think, don't assume that everybody sees it the way that you do. Sometimes in other cultures, it might be, you know, where they don't, they didn't have the same exposure or they didn't see things the same way that my culture saw it. You know, I, I yeah. come from, it's okay to just put somebody on blast. And I mean, I don't think that it's okay, but we're kind of very far. Or it's kind of like the norm in different cultures to do certain it, things. It, yeah. it, it, it is, it is. And just, I think, you know, one of the things I've realized recently since I've gotten really into this podcasting, and I think you've noticed it too, is you kind of have to use social media to promote this. Mm -hmm. And you and I are both friends with certain groups and they're international groups. And you, I just noticed that there's, there's definitely some cultural differences out there. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. But and yeah, I mean, at the same time, it's important to acknowledge them and not like hold that against them. If they oh, have like, no. a different, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, honestly, I think it's an opportunity to maybe, learn something new and hey, definitely I, yeah. I might want to adopt that practice because <laughs> you know what I mean right um, and we and I think you know that's another opportunity that we have now is because we are in a worldwide we're literally in a worldwide community mm -hmm. and we can talk to people and most of us can do this as long as you have an internet connection we basically do this for free right yeah I grew up in a time where it cost you a lot of money just to call across state you know where you had to pay long distance so mm -hmm. we have a great opportunity we truly live in a worldwide community. Um, I'm 50 years old. And just recently, you know, with, with my exploration on social media, I'm really discovering that there's a whole world out, of the, out there in the blind and low vision community um, of professionals, of achievers, of innovators, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I really, really appreciate this, this chance to talk with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed learning everything that I did today from all your stories. They're definitely very entertaining to listen to and very informative. Thanks. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe so you are notified when a new episode is posted. Rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you're leaving with some great things that will help you see beyond.